about the importance of the skill gap, the, a little bit of what types of skills are actually needed. The next question we did, because we were starting to feel a bit stressed, <laughs> we need to do something about this, yeah? So then we said, well, whose issue is this? Who's responsible for developing the skills uh, in the Irish workforce? And what we did is we gave um, we put this question out to all thousand individuals uh, as well as the hundred companies. I'll share with you what's, what the companies were saying. Um, we gave them four stakeholders, the education system, employers, employees themselves, and the government. We said, who do you think is primarily responsible? It came out essentially a tie between the education system at a third, uh, employers saying they're primarily responsible for this, and a third of them saying it's ourselves that are supposed to be creating these skills. Then there was about 20% of them that said it's employees. So are individuals in this country whose responsibility is to make sure their skills are, are up to scratch. And then the government was always the least popular, the minister's not here yet, but uh, the least popular choice. Um, if you layer in uh, people's second vote, so who's number two, you can see employers start to pull ahead. And, I don't show this because I'm going to end up saying, so it's employer's fault and we need to fix it. But what it happened in our discussion in Accenture when we were looking at these results, which I thought was interesting, is we sort of said, hold, hold on a minute. Employers are not just consumers of talent, the victims of the skills gap. We are actually one of the largest producers of talent, if not the most important, uh, in the state. Now, that's not to say the education system's off the hook. It's got a huge role to play, and there's loads we can talk about in terms of improvements and policy there and so forth. But we started to explore that notion then and saying, gosh, employers as producers of skills and not just consumers, and what does that mean? So that led us down to a road of, well, how good are we as employers at producing skills? We asked a battery of questions around learning and development, and I can only share bits of it due to time at the moment, but um, in general, what we heard, and one thing I thought was interesting, is employers were telling us that 71% of them had training programs and policies. Yeah, not bad. One I thought that was good is about 80% of them said, actually, our budget is the same or more than it was last year for training, which I was a bit surprised at. I thought, oh, you know, it's recession. That's one of the budgets you, you cut. But no, they, they said that it's the same or it's increasing. However, it got much less impressive when you started to pick around and ask, well, what are you actually spending your training budget on? And who? And how much do you spend? And the capabilities of actually being able to report on that or understand that seemed to drop off. We also saw that there seemed to be much more investment in new recruits or new hires. You know, people talked about all the pr training they did. And then when we asked, what do you do for middle management or middle tier people or, or executives, it kind of immediately <laughs> dropped right down in terms of investment. We also asked employees, those thousand folks, yeah? What's your experience of training and learning and development in your, in your companies? And just over half of them claimed to work for someone that actually had a training program or policy, which means 48% of them don't, um, or don't believe there one as exists. And 44% of the folks replied and said that I've had less than a day uh, to know uh, training in the past year. So, by the way, training is not the end-all be-all of skills development in our companies, and we know that primarily you learn by doing on the job, yeah? But I'm sharing this as just kind of an indicative, uh, you know, let's say, lifting up the mirror for ourselves to look at in terms of how we're doing it internally. Um, what I want to add on to this is, is from our own client experience and my, my sense of how it's going out there, is you, you take these statistics and then... You know, there's been a lot of organizations that, if nothing else, have dialed down recruitment, if not shut them off uh, in some places. We've had decreased attrition. I've seen that across a lot of my clients because folks aren't voluntarily leaving uh, at, uh, over the past few years. 
promotions, not necessarily as much as they used to be. Yeah, so there's a bit of stagnation there. We've had a raft of over the past two to three years, voluntary redundancy programs, early retirement schemes, which have essentially leached out skills you know, as well. And you end up getting what we were calling a blocked organization from a skills perspective. Yeah, an organization that's, ooh, you know, we're not really taking many new people in, not many folks are leaving, and there's not a lot of movement, maybe as there used to be in the organization. And we're calling that a skills blockage. Because ideally what we'd like is what we call talent flow. People kind of pick up skills in their job. They're given new things to do, or they move laterally and, and gain a breadth of skills, or they move up into a specialist role or up into a leadership role. And in doing so, they snowball, and their skills are created, yeah? And that talent flow is extremely healthy. And that's in organizations as well as out of organizations, yeah? From a macro perspective, if you lose someone, it's someone else's gain. Or if someone else has lost someone, it could be your gain <laughs> in your company. But that whole idea of the movement and the flow is something that we talk about, that it's really healthy in organizations and something to reflect on whether or not it's happening uh, in your own. So some of the levers, and I'm not going to go through all of these. These are in the handout. You all have a, a handout there. And also a broader, uh, a bigger package of our research is over here on slide seven, which is where my team <laughs> is setting that I'm referring to earlier. We have some printouts of the, of the larger set of research if you're interested in it. Um, Essentially, what we're suggesting to employers, the skill developers, is first be clear about what it is the skills are that you actually need. And a granular, granular enough detail that it's actionable. Yeah? And also consider what are you going to need in three years. Be a bit proactive. Not just what your vacancies are at the moment, but be a bit proactive. Yeah? Two, think about what skills you're already sitting on. Yeah? There has been a lot of this. I've experienced stories across some of my own clients where they have a recruitment vacancy open for eight months or something, and suddenly someone asks, well, did you ask Mary? She did that for six years before she joined us. You know, like, what? Mary, would you? Oh, yeah, I was kind of thinking that would be an interesting role, but I didn't want to raise my hand. I know you went externally and everything for it, but, you know, and then suddenly you move them in. There is, or Java, I know that's a very popular one, for example. I was at another client who had a, um, looking for Java skills and assumed they didn't have any and was stressed and, and they ended up doing a bit of an inventory of their own people and found out they had a handful of, um, it was mostly men, that were actually doing Java programming in the evenings just for fun because they were building their own website. And of course we thought, well you don't do that in work so I assume you can't do it. Right? So number two is about, think about the skills you're already sitting on and whether or not you have some people that are at least close enough to some of these positions that you could develop them into those. Um, three and four is just about taking learning and development pretty seriously. You know, there, there sounds like there's a pot of money out there and to just glance your eye over it one more time and question where that's being spent uh, in that investment and so forth. Um, there's also a topic around line managers being talent managers and making sure they're incentivized and see it's part of their role to know what skills uh, are, are critical for the organization and that they should be helping uh, the leadership team spot this potential out in the organization so it can grow. And lastly, a lot of research, whether it be World Economic Forum or, or, or OECD, talk a lot about this thing of collaboration, that if we're going to solve the skills gap, we need collaboration across sectors uh, and so forth. And I can say myself, I've, I've been to American Chamber of Commerce events and IBEC events and you know, here today and, and then with my own client work and the research, um, there is a lot going on in the skills area in Ireland at the moment, uh, with not-for-profits, you know, for example, as well. I think a little bit of joining the dots <laughs> so that people know what's going on a little, uh, would be a, um, of a huge benefit uh, to us all. And so I'd encourage that, and that's why I'm excited to be here today. Uh, and with that, I'll say thank you and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.